OK, welcome everybody to this special production of An Inspector Calls. Um, so we've got a special performance today with some familiar faces playing some of the characters that you might meet in An Inspector Calls. But before we get on to the performance, we're just going to tell you a little bit about um, the play itself. So the play was written by a man called J.P. Priestley. Um, and he wrote the play after the Second World War, um, in around 1945 and 1946. Um, and although J.B. Priestley is British, he's actually from Bradford in Yorkshire, it was first performed in the Soviet Union. Now, we um, now call the Soviet Union Russia. The Soviet Union disbanded um, in the 90s, but um, back then that's what it was called. We now know it as Russia. And so the play was translated into Russia, into Russian, um, and it was first performed there. And then it was performed in London shortly after, and it has been successful ever since. Um, still, you can go and see it today. There's often performances on. So hugely successful play, and the play that J.B. Priestley is most well known for. It is a post-war drama, so it was written after the war. And because of that, it, it explores economic, political and social issues of the time. Now, the World War II cannot be underestimated in its significance for the 20th century and the impact that it had in changing um, society as we know it. And lots of um, what we know about modern day society actually originates in the few years following World War II. For example, the NHS were founded um, after World War II as a direct result of the war. Um, it is a historical drama, however. It is actually set 30 years prior in the run-up to World War I. It's set in 1912. And this allows Priestley to use dramatic irony throughout the play. He uses it to mock some of the characters and also to provide the audience, a 1945-1946 audience, with another perspective on 1912 and the events that took place there. Now, Priestley's play he considers realistic characters. All of these characters could have existed. Obviously, they are fictional, but um, they, they could have existed. They're realistic characters. And it centres around the Beerling family, who are an upper middle class family. The arrival of the inspector halfway through Act One creates the possibility of actions beyond rational reasoning. And so we can consider um, the idea of the inspector is an omniscient presence in the play. Um, the play can be seen as a hinge between the realistic plays of the early 20th century and the more experimental dramas of the second half of the 20th century. And it also um, has elements of a whodunit or detective drama in it, which were very popular at the time. The mousetrap, um, which you might have heard of, was very, very popular at the time Priestley wrote an inspector cause. Now, Priestley himself, he broadly sympathised with socialism, which is a key term you'll come across in your study of an inspector cause. He was actually um, quite important in helping to set up the Labour Party, who um, grew in prominence post World War II. And um, some of his views, he uses the inspector as his mouthpiece to get across to the audience. Now, the play that you're going to hear today starts in a dining room in the fictional town of Brumley. The dining room is the only set that you'll see, and you'll see that um, our backgrounds have been changed to reflect that. Um, in the fictional town of Brumley, and you can have a think about which current city Brumley sounds a little bit like. So, like I said, there's some familiar faces in our cast today. So just going to introduce our all-star cast. So playing Mr. Beerling is Mr. Lefley. Mrs. Beerling will be played by Miss Ormondy. Inspector Ghoul is going to be played by Mr. Stanton. Sheila Beerling is going to be played by Mrs. Salgaro and her brother Eric Beerling by Mr. Fitzgerald. And Gerald Croft is going to be played 
screen and as you can tell from my outfit I'm going to be playing Edna the maid. So I'm going to be your host and um, I'm going to stop after every act. There are three acts in total. We're going to have a little bit of discussion um, uh, about what we've found so far. So sit back, enjoy and welcome to Wales High Does in Inspector Calls. Act one. The dining room of a fairly large suburban house belonging to a prosperous manufacturer. It has good solid furniture of the period. The general effect is substantial and heavily comfortable, but not cosy and homelike. The lighting should be pink and intimate until the inspector arrives, and then it should be brighter and harder. At Rise of the Curtain, the four Burlings and Gerald are seated at the table, with Arthur Burling at one end, his wife at the other, Eric downstage, and Sheila and Gerald seated upstage. Edna, the parlour maid, is just clearing the table, which is no cloth, of dessert plates and champagne glasses, etc., and then replacing them with a decanter of port, cigar box and cigarettes. Port glasses are already on the table. All five are in evening dress of the period, the men in tails and white ties, not dinner jackets. Arthur Bailing is a heavy looking, rather portentous man in his middle fifties with fairly easy manners, but rather provincial in his speech. His wife is about 50, a rather cold woman and her husband's social superior. Sheila is a pretty girl in her early twenties, very pleased with life and rather excited. Gerald Croft is an attractive chap about 30, rather too manly to be a dandy, but very much the easy, well-bred young man about town. Eric is in his early 20s, not quite at ease, half shy, half assertive. At the moment, they have all had a good dinner, are celebrating a special occasion and are pleased with themselves. Giving us the port, Edna. That's right. You ought to like this port, Gerald. As a matter of fact, Finchley told me it's exactly the same port your father gets from him. Then it'll be all right. The governor prides himself on being a good judge of port. I don't pretend to know much about it. I should jolly well think not. Gerald, I hate you to know about port. Not one of these purple-faced old men. Here, I'm not a purple-faced old man. No, not yet. But then you don't know about port, do you? Now then, Sybil, you must take a little tonight. Special occasion, you know, eh? Yes, go on, Mummy. You must drink our health. Very well, then. Just a little. Thank you. All right, Edna. I'll ring from the drawing room when we want coffee, probably in about half an hour. Yes, ma'am. Well, well, this is very nice. Very, very nice. Good dinner too, Sybil. Tell cook from me. Absolutely. First class. Arthur, you're not supposed to say such things. Oh, come, come. I'm treating Gerald like one of the family, and I'm sure he won't object. <laughs> Go on, Gerald. Just you object. I wouldn't dream of it. In fact, I insist upon being one of the family now. I've been trying long enough, haven't I? Haven't I? You know I have. Of course she does. Yes, except for all last summer when you never came near me and I wondered what had happened to you. I've told you... I I was awfully busy at the works all the time. Yes, that's what you say. Now, Sheila, don't tease him. When you're married, you'll realise that men with important work to do sometimes have to spend nearly all their time and energy on their business. You'll have to get used to that, just as I had. Well, I don't believe I will, so you be careful. Oh, I will. I will. Now, what's the joke? Eric, we can't quite hear you there. I said, I don't know really. Suddenly I felt I just had to laugh. You're squiffy. I'm not. What expression, Sheila, really, the things you girls pick up these days. If you think that's the best she can do. Don't be an ass, Eric. Now stop it, you two. Arthur, what about that famous toast of yours? Yes, of course. <clears throat> well, Gerald, I know you agreed that we should only have this quiet little family party. It's a pity Sir George and uh, Lady Croft can't be with us. But you're abroad and so it can't be helped. As I told you, they sent me a very nice cable. Couldn't be nicer. 
I'm not sorry that we're celebrating quietly like this. Much nicer, really. I agree. So do I. But it makes speech making more difficult. Well, don't do any. We'll drink their health and I've done with it. <laughs> no, we won't. It's one of the happiest nights of my life. And one day, I hope, Eric, when you've a daughter of your own, you'll understand why. Gerald, I'm going to tell you frankly, without any pretenses, that your engagement to Sheila means a tremendous lot to me. She'll make you happy, and I'm sure you'll make her happy. You're just the kind of son-in-law I've always wanted. Your father and I have been friendly rivals in business for some time now, through Crofts Limited, are both older and bigger than Berling and Company. And now you've brought us together, and perhaps we may look forward to a time when Crofts and Berlins are no longer competing, but we're working together for lower costs and higher prices. Hear, hear. And I think my father would agree to that. Now, Arthur, I don't think you ought to talk business on an occasion like this. Neither do I. All wrong. Quite so. I agree with you. I only mentioned it in passing. What I did want to say was that Sheila's a lucky girl, and I think you're a pretty fortunate young man too, Gerald. I know I am. This once, anyhow. So here's to wishing the pair of you the very best that life can bring, Gerald and Sheila. Yes, Gerald. And Sheila, darling, our congratulations and very best wishes. Thank you. Eric? All the best. She's got a nasty temper sometimes, but she's not really that bad. Good old Sheila. Chump, I can't drink to this, can I? When do I get to drink? You can drink to me. All right, then. I drink to you, Gerald. Thank you. And I... I... Drink to you. And I hope I can make you as happy as you deserve to be. You be careful or I'll start weeping. Well, perhaps this will help you to stop it. <gasps> oh, Gerald, you've got it. Isn't that one you wanted me to have? Yes, the very one. Oh, it's wonderful. Look, Mummy, isn't it a beauty? Oh, darling. Steady the buffs. I think it's perfect. Now I really feel engaged. So you ought, darling. It's a lovely ring. Be careful with it. Careful? I'll never let it go out of my sight for an instant. Well, it just came at the right moment. That was clever of you, Gerald. Now, Arthur, if you've no more to say, I think Sheila and I had better go into the drawing room and leave you men. I just want to say this. Are you listening, Sheila? This concerns you too. And after all, I don't often make speeches at you... I'm sorry, Daddy. Actually, I was listening. I'm delighted about this engagement, and I hope it won't be long before you marry. And I want to say this. There's a good deal of silly talk about these days, but and I speak as a hard-headed businessman who has to take risks and know what he's about. I say you can ignore all this silly, pessimistic talk. When you marry, you'll be marrying at a very good time. Yes, a very good time. And soon, it'll be an even better time. Last month, just because the miners came out on strike, there's a lot of wild talk about possible labour trouble in the near future. Don't worry, we've passed the worst of it. We employers at last are coming together to see that our interests and the interests of capital are properly protected. And we're in for a time of steadily increasing prosperity. I believe you're right, sir. Well, what about war? Ah, glad you mentioned it, Eric. I'm coming to that. Just because the Kaiser makes a speech or two, or a few German officers have too much to drink and begin talking nonsense, you'll hear some people say that war's inevitable. And to that I say, fiddlesticks, the Germans don't want war. Nobody wants war, except some half civilized folks in the Balkans. And why? There's too much at stakes these days. Everything to lose and nothing to gain by war. Yes, I know, um, but still. Just let me finish, Eric. You've a lot to learn yet. And I'm talking as a hard-headed, practical man of business. And I say there isn't a chance of war. The world's developing so fast that it'll make war impossible. Look at the progress we're making. In a year or two, we'll have aeroplanes that'll be able to go anywhere. And look at the way automobiles making headway, bigger and faster all the time. And then ships. Why, a friend of mine went over to this new liner last week, uh, the Titanic. She sails next week, 46,800 tonnes. 46,800 tonnes, New York in five days, and every luxury, and 
unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. That's what you've got to keep your eye on. Facts like that, progress like that. And not a few German officers talking nonsense and a few scaremongers here and there making fuss about nothing. Now, you three young people, you just listen to this and remember what I'm telling you now. In 20 or 30 years time, let's say, in 1940, you may be given a little party like this. Your son or daughter may be getting engaged. And I tell you, by the time you'll be living in a world that will have forgotten about all these capital versus labour agitations and all these silly little war scares, there'll be peace and prosperity and rapid progress everywhere, except, of course, in Russia, which will always be behind hand, naturally. After. Yes, my dear, I know I'm talking too much, but you youngsters just remember what I said. We can't let these Bernard Shaws and H.G. Wellsers do all the talking. We hard-headed practical businessmen must say something sometime. And we don't guess. We've had experience and we know. Yes, of course, dear. Well, don't keep Gerald in here too long. Eric, I want you a minute. Cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Can't really enjoy them. Ah, uh, you don't know what you're missing. I like a good cigar. Help yourself. Thank you. OK, thank you. By the way, there's something I'd like to mention in strict confidence. Uh, while we're by ourselves, I have an idea that your mother, Lady Croft, while she doesn't object to my girl, feels you might have done better for yourself socially. Uh, uh... Uh, no, Joe. No, no, that's all right. Don't blame her. She comes from an old country family, landed people and so forth. And so it's only natural. But I wanted to say is this. There's a fair chance that I might find my way into the next honours list. Just to knighthood, of course. Oh, I say. Congratulations. Thanks. But it's a bit too early for that. So don't say anything. But I've had a hint or two. You see, I was Lord Mayor here for two years ago when Royalty visited, and I've always been regarded as a sound, useful party man. So, well, I gather there's a good chance of a knighthood, so long as we behave ourselves and don't get into the police court or start a scandal. Eh? <laughs> you seem to be a uh, nice, well-behaved family. Well, we think we are. So, if that's the only obstacle, sir, I think you might as well accept my congratulations now. No, 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 I couldn't do that. And don't say anything. Not even to my mother? I, I, I know she'd be delighted. Well, when she comes back, you might drop a hint to her and you can promise her that we'll try to keep out of trouble during the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> What's the joke? Started telling stories? No. Want another glass of port? No, yes, please. Mother says you mustn't stay too long, but I don't think it matters. I left them talking about clothes again. You'd think a girl had never had any clothes before she gets married. Women are potty about him. Uh, yes, but you've got to remember, my boy, that clothes mean something quite different to women. Not just something to wear and not something to make them look prettier, but, well, a sort of sign or token of their self-respect. That's true. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> well, what do you remember? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> Sounds a bit fishy to me. Yes, yes. So you don't know what some of these boys get up to nowadays. More money to spend and time to spare than I'd had when I was Eric's age. They've worked us hard in those days and kept us short of cash, though even then we broke out and had a bit of fun sometimes. <laughs> I'll bet you did. But this is the point. I don't want to lecture you two young fellows again. But what so many of you don't seem to understand now, when things are so much easier, is that a man has to make his own way, has to look after himself and his family too, of course, when he has one. And so long as he does that, he won't come to much harm. But the way some of these cranks tell and write it now, you'd think everybody has to look after everybody else, as if we were all mixed up together, like bees in a hive, community and all that nonsense. But take my word for it, you youngsters, and I've learnt in the good hard school of experience that a man has to mind his own business and look after himself and his own and... Somebody at the front door. Oh, Edna will answer it. We'll have another glass of port, Gerald, and then we'll join the ladies. That'll stop me giving you advice. Good advice. Yes, you've piled it on a bit tonight, Father. Special occasion and feeling contented for once. I wanted you to have the benefit of my experience. 
police say it. An, an inspector's called. An inspector? What kind of inspector? A police inspector. He says his name's Inspector Ghoul. Don't know him. Does he want to see me? Yes, sir. He, he says it's important. All right, Edna. Show him in here. Give us some more light. I'm still on the bench. It may be something about a warrant. Sure, sir. <laughs> Unless Eric's been up to something. And that would be awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> Very. Uh, here, what, what do you mean? Only something we were talking about when you were out. A joke, really. Well, I don't think it's very funny. Uh, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Inspector Ghoul. The inspector enters and Edna goes. Mr Burling. Yes. Sit down, Inspector. Thank you, sir. I have a glass of port or, or a uh, little whiskey. No, thank you, Mr. Burling. I'm on duty. You're new, aren't you? Yes, sir. Only recently transferred. I thought you must be. I was an alderman for years and Lord Mayor two years ago, and I'm still on the bench, so I know the Brumley police officers pretty well, and I thought I'd never seen you before. Quite so. Well, what can I do for you? Some trouble about a warrant? No, Mr Burley. Well, uh, what is it then? I'd like some information, if you don't mind, Mr Burley. Two hours ago, a young woman died in the infirmary. She'd been taken there this afternoon because she'd swallowed a lot of blood-strong disinfectant. Burnt her inside out, of course. My God! Yes, she was in great agony. They did everything they could for her at the infirmary, but she died. Suicide, of course. Yes, yes, horrible business, but I don't understand why you should come here, Inspector. I've been round to the room she had, and she'd left a letter there in a sort of diary. Like a lot of these young women who get into various kinds of trouble, she'd used more than one name. But her original name, her real name, was Eva Smith. Eva Smith. Do you remember her, Mr. Burling? No, I seem to remember hearing the name Eva Smith somewhere, but it doesn't convey anything to me. And I don't see where I come into this. She was employed in your works at one time. Oh, that's it, is it? Well, we've several hundred young women there, you know, and they keep changing. This young woman, Eva Smith, was a bit out of the ordinary. I found a photograph of her in her lodgings. Perhaps you'll remember her from that. Inspector takes a photograph about postcard size out of his pocket and goes to Burling. Both Gerald and Eric rise to have a look at the photograph, but the inspector interposes himself between them and the photograph. They are surprised and rather annoyed. Burling stares hard and with recognition at the photograph, which the inspector then replaces in his pocket. Uh, any particular reason why I shouldn't see these girls? Photograph, Inspector? There might be. And the same applies to me, I suppose. Yes. I can't imagine what it could be. Neither can I. And I must say I agree with them, Inspector. It's the way I like to go to work. One person and one line of inquiry at a time. Otherwise, there's a muddle. I see. Sensible, really. You've had enough of that poor Eric. I think you remember Eva Smith now, don't you, Mr Burling? Yes, I do. She was one of my employees, and then I discharged her. Is that why she committed suicide? When was this, Father? Uh, just keep quiet, Eric, and don't get excited. This girl left us nearly two years ago. Let me see. It must have been in the early autumn of 1910. Yes, end of September, 1910. That's right. Uh, look, look here, sir. Now, wouldn't you rather I was out of this? I don't mind you being here, Gerald, and I'm sure you've no objection, have you, Inspector? Perhaps I ought to explain that this is Mr Gerald Croft, the son of Sir George Croft. You know, Crofts Limited. Mr Gerald Croft, eh? 
Yes, incidentally, we've been modestly celebrating his engagement to my daughter, Sheila. I see. Mr Croft is going to marry Miss Sheila Burling. I hope so. Then I'd prefer you to stay. Oh, all right. Look, there's nothing mysterious or scandalous about this business, at least not so far as I'm concerned. It's a perfectly straightforward case. And as it happened more than 18 months ago, nearly two years ago, obviously, it has nothing uh, whatever to do with this wretched girl's suicide. Eh, Inspector? No, sir. I can't agree with you there. Why not? Because what happened to her then may have determined what happened to her afterwards. And what happened to her afterwards may have driven her to suicide. A chain of events. Oh, well, put like that, there's something in it, You uh, what you say. Still, I can't accept any responsibility. If we're all responsible for everything that happened to everybody we'd had anything to do with, it would be very awkward, wouldn't it? Oh, very awkward. We'd all be in an impossible situation, wouldn't we? By Joe, yes. And as you were saying, Dad, a man has to look after himself. Yes, well, we needn't go into all that. Go into what? Oh, just before you came, I'd been giving these young men a little good advice. Now, about this girl, Eva Smith. I remember her quite well now. She was a lively, good-looking girl, country-bred. I fancy, and she'd been working in one of our machine shops for over a year. A good worker, too, in fact. The foreman told me that she was ready to promote her into what we call a leading operator, head of a small group of girls. But after they came back from their holidays that August, they were all rather restless, and they suddenly decided to ask for more money. They were averaging about 22 and 6, which was neither more nor less than he's paid generally in our industry. They wanted the rates raised so that they could average about 25 shillings a week. I refused, of course. Why? Did you say why? Yes. Why did you refuse? Well, Inspector, I don't see there's any of concern of yours how I choose to run my business, is it now? It might be, you know. I don't like the tone. Well, I'm sorry, but you asked me a question. And you asked me a question before that, and quite an unnecessary question too. It's my duty to ask questions. Well, it's my duty to keep labour costs down. And if I'd agreed to all this demand for a new rate, we'd have about 12% to our labour cost. Does that satisfy you? So I refused, said I couldn't consider it. We were paying the usual rates, and if they didn't like those rates, they could go and work somewhere else. It's a free country, I told them. It isn't if you can't go and work somewhere else. Quite so. Look, you just keep out of this. You haven't even started in the works when this happened. So they went on strike. That didn't last long, of course. Not if it was just after the holidays. They'd all be broke, if I know them. Right, Gerald. They mostly were. And so was the strike after a week or two. Pitiful affair. Well, we let them all come back at the old rates, except for the four or five ringleaders who'd started the trouble. I went down myself and told them to clear out. And this girl, Eva Smith, was one of them. She had a lot to say, far too much. So she had to go. He couldn't have done anything else. He could. He could have kept her on instead of throwing her out. I call it tough luck. Rubbish. If you don't come down sharply on some of these people, they'd soon be asking for the earth. I should say so. They might, but after all, it's better to ask for the earth than to take it. What did you say your name was, Inspector? Ghoul. G-O-O-L-E. How do you get on with our Chief Constable, Colonel Roberts? I don't see much of him. Perhaps I ought to warn you that he's an old friend of mine and that I see him fairly frequently. We play golf together sometimes up at West Brumley. I don't play golf. I didn't suppose you did. Well, I think it's a damn shame. No, I've never wanted to play. No, I mean about this girl, Eva Smith. Why shouldn't they try for higher wages? We try for the highest possible prices. And I don't see why she should have been sacked just because she had a bit more spirit than the others. You said yourself, she was a good worker. I'd have let her stay. Unless you brighten your ideas, you'll never be in a position to let anybody stay or tell anybody to go. It's about time you learn to face a few responsibilities. That's something this public school and varsity life you've had doesn't seem to teach you. Well, we don't need to tell the inspector all about that, do we? 
I don't see why we need to tell the inspector anything more. In fact, there's nothing I can tell him. I told the girl to clear out and she went. That's the last I heard of her. Have you any idea what happened to her after that? Get into trouble? Go on the streets? No, she didn't exactly go on the streets. What is it about streets? Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Mummy sent me in to ask why I didn't come along to the drawing room. Uh, we shall be in along, uh, along in a minute now, just finishing. I'm afraid not. There's nothing else, you know. I've just told you that. What's all this about? Nothing to do with you, Sheila. Run along. No, wait a minute, Miss Burling. Look here, Inspector. I consider this uncalled for and officious. I've half a mind to report you. I've told you all I know, and it doesn't seem to me very important. Now, there isn't the slightest reason why my daughter should be dragged into this unpleasant business. What business? What's happening? I'm a police inspector, Miss Burling. This afternoon, a young woman drank some disinfectant and died after several hours of agony tonight in the infirmary. Oh, how horrible. Was it an accident? No. She wanted to end her life. She felt she couldn't go on any longer. Well, don't tell me that's because I discharged her from my employment nearly two years ago. That might have started it. Did you, Dad? Yes, that girl had been causing trouble in the works. I was quite justified. Yes, I think you were. I know we'd have done the same thing. Don't look like that, Sheila. Uh, sorry, it's just I can't help thinking about this girl destroying herself so horribly. Oh, and I've been so happy tonight. Oh, I wish you hadn't told me. What was she like? Young? Yes, 24. Pretty? She wasn't pretty when I saw her today, but she had been pretty, very pretty. That's enough of that. I don't really see this inquiry gets you anywhere, Inspector. It's what happened to her since she left Mr. Bowling's works that's important. Obviously. I suggested that some time ago. We can't help you there because we don't know. Are you sure you don't know? Uh, and are you suggesting now that one of them knows something about this girl? Yes. You didn't come here just to see me then? No. Well, of course, if I'd known that earlier, I wouldn't have called you officious and talked about reporting you. You understand that, don't you, Inspector? I thought that for some reason, best known to yourself, you were making the most of this tiny bit of information I could give you. I'm sorry. This makes a difference. Are you sure of your facts? Some of them, yes. I can't think they can be of any great consequence. The girl's dead, though. What do you mean by saying that? You talk as if we were responsible. Just a minute, Sheila. Now, Inspector, perhaps you and I had better go and talk this over quietly in a corner. Why should you? He's finished with you. He says it's one of us now. Yes, and I'm trying to settle it sensibly for you. Well, there's nothing to settle as far as I'm concerned. I've never known Eva Smith. Neither have I. Was that her name? Eva Smith? Yes. Never heard it before. So, where are you now, Inspector? Where I was before, Mr Croft. I told you that like a lot of these young women, she'd used more than one name. She was still Eva Smith when Mr Burling sacked her for wanting 25 shillings a week instead of 22 and 6. But after that, she stopped being Eva Smith. Perhaps she'd had enough of it. Can't blame her. I think it was a mean thing to do. Perhaps that spoils everything for her. Rubbish. Do you know what happened to this girl after she left my works? Yes. She was out of work for the next two months. Both of her parents were dead, so that she'd no home to go back to. And she hadn't been able to save much out of what Burling and company had paid her. So that after two months, with no work, no money coming in and living in lodgings, with no relatives to help her, few friends, lonely, half-starved, she was feeling desperate. I should think so. It's a rotten shame. There are a lot of young women living that sort of existence in every city and big town in this country, Miss Burling. If there weren't, the factories and warehouses wouldn't know where to look for cheap labour. Ask your father. But these girls aren't cheap labour. They're people. 
I've had that notion myself from time to time. In fact, I've thought it would all do us a, it would do us a bit of good if we tried to put ourselves in the place of these young women counting their pennies in their dingy little back bedrooms. Yes, I expect it would. But what happened to her then? She had what seemed to her a wonderful stroke of luck. She was taken on in a shop, and a good shop too. Millwoods. Millwoods. We go there. In fact, I was there this afternoon, for your benefit. Good. Yes, she was looking to get taken on at Millwoods. Yeah, that's what she thought. And it happened that at the beginning of December that year, 1910, there was a good deal of influenza about, and Millwoods suddenly found themselves short-handed. So that gave her a chance. It seemed she liked working there. It was a nice change from a factory. She enjoyed being among pretty clothes, I've no doubt. And now she felt she was making a good, fresh start. You can imagine how she felt. Yes, of course. Yeah. Then she got herself into trouble there, I suppose. After about a couple of months, just when she felt she was settling down nicely, they told her she'd have to go. <laughs> Not doing her work properly? There was nothing wrong with the way she was doing her work. They admitted that. There must have been something wrong. All she knew was that a customer complained about her, and so she had to go. When was this? At the end of January last year. What did this girl look like? If you'll come over here, I'll show you. He moves nearer a light, perhaps standard lamp, and she crosses to him. He produces the photograph. She looks at it closely, recognises it with a little cry, gives a half-stifled sob, and then runs out. The What's inspector the with puts her? the photograph back into his pocket and stares speculatively after her. The other three stare in amazement for a moment. What is the matter with her? She recognised her from the photograph, didn't she? Yes. Why the devil do you want to go upsetting the child like that? I didn't do it. She's upsetting herself. Well, why? Why? I don't know yet. That's something I have to find out. Well, if you don't mind, I'll find out first. Shall I go to her? No, leave this to me. I must also have a word with my wife. Tell her what's happening. We were having a nice little family celebration tonight and a nasty mess you've made of it now, haven't you? That's more or less what I was thinking earlier tonight when I were in the infirmary looking at what was left of Eva Smith. A nice little promising life there, I thought, and a nasty mess somebody's made of it. I'd like to have a look at that photograph now, Inspector. All in good time. I, I don't see why... You heard what I said before, Mr Croft. One line of inquiry at a time. Otherwise, we'll all be talking at once and we won't know where we are. If you've anything to tell me, you'll have an opportunity of doing it soon. Well, I don't suppose I have. Look here. I've had enough of this. I dare say. I'm sorry, but you see, we were having a little party and, uh, and I've had a few drinks, including rather a lot of champagne. And I've got a headache. And as I'm the only... In the way here, I thought I'd better turn in. And I think you'd better stay here. Why should I? It might be less trouble. If you turn in, you might have to turn out again soon. You think a bit heavy-handed, aren't you, Inspector? Possibly. But if you're easy with me, I'm easy with you. After all, you know, we're, we're respectable citizens and not criminals. Sometimes there isn't as much difference as you think. Often, if it was left to me, I wouldn't know where to draw the line. Fortunately, it isn't left to you, is it? No, it isn't. But some things are left to me. Inquiries of this sort, for instance. Well, Miss Burling. You knew it was me all the time, didn't you? I had an idea it might be, from something the girl herself wrote. I've told my father. He didn't seem to think it amounted to much, but... I felt rotten about it at the time, and now I feel a lot worse. Did it make much difference to her? Yes, I'm afraid it did. It was the, real, it was the last real steady job she had. When she lost it for no reason that she could discover, 
she decided she might as well try another kind of life. So I'm really responsible? No, not entirely. A good deal happened to her after that, but you're partly to blame, just as your father is. But what did Sheila do? I went to the manager at Millwoods and I told him that if they didn't get rid of that girl, I'd never go near the place again, and I'd persuade Mother to close our account with them. And why did you do that? Because I was in a furious temper. And what had this girl done to make you lose your temper? When I was looking at myself in the mirror, I caught sight of her smiling at the assistant and I was furious with her. I'd been in a bad temper anyhow. And was it the girl's fault? No, not really. It was my own fault. All right, Gerald, you needn't look at me like that. At least I'm trying to tell you the truth. I expect you've done things you're ashamed of too. Well, I never said I hadn't. I don't see why... Never mind about that. You can settle that between you afterwards. What happened? I'd gone in to try something on. It was an idea of my own. Mother had been against it, and so had the assistant. But I insisted. As soon as I tried it on, I knew they'd been right. It just didn't suit me at all. I just looked silly in the thing. Well, this girl had brought the dress up from the workroom. And when the assistant, Miss Francis, had asked her something about it, this girl, to show us what she meant, had held the dress up as if she was wearing it. And it just suited her. She was a right type for it, just as I was a wrong type. She was a very pretty girl, too, with big dark eyes, and that didn't make it any better. Well, when I tried the thing on and looked at myself and knew that it was all wrong, I caught sight of this girl smiling at Miss Frances as if to say, doesn't she look awful? And I was absolutely furious. I was very rude to both of them. And when I went to the manager and told him that this girl had been very impertinent and, and... Well, how could I know what would happen afterwards? If she'd been some miserable, plain little creature, I don't suppose I'd have done it. But she was very pretty and looked as if she could take care of herself. I couldn't be sorry for her. In fact, in a kind of way, you might be said to have been jealous of her. Yes, I suppose so. And so you used the power you had as a daughter of a good customer and also of a man well known in the town to publish the girl, just punish the girl just because she had made you feel like that. Yes, but it didn't seem to be anything very terrible at the time. Don't you understand? And if I could help her now, I would. Yes, but you can't. It's too late. She's dead. My God, it's a bit thick when you come to think of it. Oh, shut up, Eric. I know, I know. It's the only time I've ever done anything like that, and I'll never, never do it again to anybody. I've noticed them giving me a sort of look sometimes in Mulwoods. I noticed it again this afternoon. And I suppose some of them remember, remember, and I feel that I could never go there again. Oh, why had this to happen? That's why I asked myself tonight when I was looking at that dead girl. And I said to myself, well, we'll try to understand why it had to happen. And that's why I'm here and why I'm not going until I know all that happened. Eva Smith lost her job with Burling and Company because the strike failed and they were determined not to have another one. At last, she found another job. Under what name? I don't know. In a big shop. And she had to leave there because you were annoyed with yourself and passed the annoyance on to her. Now she had to try something else. So first, she changed her name to Daisy Renton. What? I said she changed her name to Daisy Renton. Uh, do you mind if I give myself a drink, Sheila? Where is your father, Miss Burling? He went to the drawing room to tell my mother what was happening here. Eric, take the inspector along to the drawing room. Well, Gerald? Well, what? Yeah. How did you come to know this girl, Eva I, Smith? I didn't. Well, Daisy Renton, then. It's the same thing. Why should I have known her? Oh, don't be stupid. We haven't much time. You gave yourself away as soon as he mentioned her other name. All right. I knew her. Let's leave it at that. We can't leave it at that. Now, listen, darling. No, that's no use. You not only knew her, but you knew her very well. Otherwise, you wouldn't look so guilty about it. 
When did you first get to know her? Was it after she left Millwoods? When she changed her name, as he said, and began to leave a different sort of life? Were you seeing her last spring and summer during that time you hardly came near me and said you were so busy? Were you? Yes, of course you were. I'm sorry, Sheila. It was all over and done with last summer. I, I hadn't set eyes on the girl for at least six months. I, I don't come into this suicide business. I thought I didn't half an hour ago. No, neither of us does. So, uh, for God's sake, don't say anything to me. Better. About you and this girl? Yes, we can keep it from him. <laughs> Why, you fool? He knows. Of course he knows. And I hate to think how much he knows that we don't know yet. You'll see. You'll see. Well. Okay, so that is the end of Act One. Um, and so you should see some questions coming up on your screen. And um, now if you're in class or if you're at home, this might be a good point to pause the video. You can spend some time either discussing the questions if you're in class or writing down some answers to the questions and um, because in a moment um myself and, and our actors today are going to have a little bit of a discussion about these three questions so you could always use that to self-assess your own answers and to add anything you've missed so if you are in school or you're at home and you're working remotely you might just want to pause here to consider these three questions so the first one is how do we feel about the bailings at this stage We've had that sort of introduction to the play and a really good place to look here would be the stage directions. What is the first impression? How does he want us to react to them? How does he want us to feel about them? Who does he want us to like? Who does he want us to dislike? Mr. Burling is selfish and consumed by his sense of status. Discuss. Now, um, I think Mr. Leffley did an amazing job as uh, Mr. Burling in um in that scene and so i think actually you know think about how much mr leffley actually talked um in that act and what does he talk about this is his daughter's engagement party and um, what is he happy about where are his priorities and the final question what is priestly saying about society at the start of the play who benefits from this society and who doesn't um, and there's just some things to think about. So if I can just welcome all of our actors back and just a reminder to turn your cameras on so we can see you all in your wonderful costumes. Um, so um, how do we, Eric's obviously off, um, still on the whiskey, <laughs> um, but how do we feel um, about the feelings at this stage, and I, I think um, if and no one minds, I'm going to start this one off. Um, obviously, playing the character of Edna, I'm the only working class presence on stage, um, and I think I've had about three lines so far. And um, what I find quite interesting, actually, is um, obviously we're not supposed to like Berling, we're supposed to think he's a complete idiot, um, and we're supposed to maybe sympathise a little bit with Sheila, who seems genuinely quite distressed at at what has happened. Um, but actually what I find quite interesting about the character of Sheila is the fact that she primarily focuses on how this news has ruined her evening. And she says, I wish I didn't know. And, um, you know, why did this have to happen? And she considers the impact on herself first. And though um, without giving anything away, Sheila turns out to be one of the characters that we like the most by the end of the play. Um, I think it's quite interesting that her reaction is quite similar to her father's. It is the impact on herself, although she does appear more empathetic towards the um, the character of Eva Smith. So I'll open it out to the to the cast. Um, how do you feel about the Beerlings at this stage? And Gerald? Um, I agree with what you say about Sheila, she's quite self-centred and quite childish and childlike at the beginning of the play, you know, calls her mum mummy. Um, so even though she's in her early 20s, she still appears to be very young and perhaps quite naive. Um, and I like the fact that when she, you know, she finds out this girl's died, you know, was she pretty? Like, that's the most important thing mm. about this girl. Like, she's very concerned with materialistic things. 
Um, so certainly at the beginning, that's how I think Sheila comes across. And Mrs. Mrs. Algaro, in um, sorry, sir, in um, my last year that we've been doing over the last few months, you've been playing Sheila every week. Yeah. Have you had a, a different insight into the character of Sheila? Um, actually playing her every week. Oh, um, I suppose it makes you think about how she responds to things more. And I guess again, without giving too much away, the way she changes throughout the course of the play. Um, and in terms of from a, I can act of playing her point of view, if you like, how differently you you begin to play her by the end of the play compared to the beginning. Um, and even, you know, not just what she says, but the way she says things towards the end is different. So certainly I've, I've definitely thought about that as I've been playing that character. Yeah. Sorry, I think it was Mr. Leffley about to say something. I interrupted him. No, it's all right. Um, I was just going to say for the students that are watching, um, and like you said, just wanted to comment about what Mr. Berlin's actually said. He's had quite a lot to say um, in that very first act, how he holds his self um, in society, what he thinks of his self and his status is quite important. Um, and we can actually get a lot of clues from what he's telling um, the younger generation when he's talking down to Eric and Gerald. And it's really, really key, um, the sort of things that he's talking about um, and the way that Priestley has put those things in purposely at the beginning um, so that we as an audience can uh, react to that. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Green. Um, I was just going to say that perhaps, um, well, I wonder what people thought of Eric and whether or not there's some early signs of him having some, like, um, redeeming features or redeeming mm. qualities at the, at the start. Like, all of them seem, to me, they seem not very likeable people, like what Mrs. Salgaro said about um, Sheila being materialistic. But there are a few, like, little moments where Eric kind of interjects and he's like, um, I think there's a bit where he says, I can't blame her for wanting to, you know, get more money, etc. Mm -hmm. I don't know what anybody else thinks about, about Eric, but he seems to be the one that is the most likeable, perhaps, at this stage. But he's also somebody who's already stolen money, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which, you know, becomes apparent later on that he's he's stolen money to um, give to this girl. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> oh, sorry, beg your pardon. <laughs> Um, the spoiler is that I have actually read the play before. <laughs> Just once, skimmed it. Um, I think um, Eric, for me, whenever I, whenever I read this, considering he's in his family home and in the heart of his family. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, Eric this. and Gerald are, are dramatic files um, to each other. And a dramatic file is when characters can be compared and, and um, mm. you know, the, the similarities between them. Um, and actually, Gerald very much seems to be the sort of son Mr. Beerling wants to have. And, and Eric seems to be a little bit of a disappointment uh, yeah. to Beerling. Yeah. He says that thing about varsity life, doesn't he? I don't know, has he said that yet? Yeah, he has. Yeah. yeah. About yeah. varsity life and um, being basically being spoiled. Really you know, interesting because ultimately he must be the one that spoiled him. So I love yeah. the fact that Mr. Burling, the things that he accuses Eric of are the things that Mr. Burling's like done to him almost. Doesn't seem very fair on Eric, does it? He almost like begrudges him, doesn't he? Like in that typical, you know, kind of because Mr. Burling would have, you know, would have been from a pretty ordinary, you know, self made man. Mm. Yeah. And he almost um, all, all of the things that he's earned and wanted probably for his family and the lifestyle. He now almost begrudges Eric. Yeah. Actually yeah. Having, yeah. You know, having a private education, having like wealth, not be, not having to, you know, work in the same way that Mr. Berlin would have worked. He, he almost can sense that he doesn't almost like him very much. Mm. I think he's just full of himself, Mr. Berlin, isn't he? He just wants to reiterate the whole time, like how hard he's worked to get where he is, and live out his little uh, Downton Abbey fantasies in Mrs. Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> But all, of, all, all of Eric's background is something that's... Sorry, big pun. Just saying that all, we've all got the same dining room furniture. <laughs> now, all, of, um, all of Eric's privileges, which his father resents, are also Gerald's privileges as well. And, and mm. Mr Green was saying, wasn't he, that... Um, you know, he 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 likes he likes the look of Gerald. This is the son he maybe would have liked to have had. And 
other than the, the the Crofts being maybe a generation ahead of the Burlings in terms of their social climb, um, it it seems to be the easiness with which Gerald, you know, he he wears his privilege very easily, whereas Eric's really quite uncomfortable about it. So that when we hear about Eva being sacked, um, Eric jumps straight in and says, "Well, that that seems really unfortunate. Seems really unfair." How can you blame anybody for wanting higher wages when we keep striving for higher and higher prices? So, um, like Sheila, I suppose, there's a little bit of a socialist in him, isn't it? Mm. There's also a lot of drink in him at this stage. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He's gone for a lie down. Yeah, he's gone for a lie down. Um, do you, do you think, do you think that he wouldn't normally say then? Because of, do you think that he, he becomes, um, he like unleashes his inner you know, conscience or, you know, yeah. feelings. Because, yeah, because less of the... conditions. He's less, like Mr. Stanton said, he's less um, comfortable playing the role of the upper class, you know, privileged. And also, as he's had a few drinks, he becomes a little bit free with his opinion. Mm. When well, you imagine him on stage, don't you, pull, pulling at the collar of his shirt and adjusting his jacket because it doesn't fit properly and... You know, whereas Gerald, just one of these people who just everything seems to fit him. And, you know, I mean, he just seems to he seems to um, he just seems to look smooth and cool and everything with poor old Eric, you know, just just looks like he's wearing somebody else's clothes. Yeah. I think um, Eric is quite antagonistic as well, actually, because I think he wants to be everything that his father isn't or he's he's scared of becoming his father. I think he looks at his father and, and thinks that's, you know, exactly who I don't want to be. So, um, you know, he poses a challenge um, to his father throughout this act, but is also quickly silenced. It's funny, time. though, isn't it? Because it, what Mr. Green said works both ways. You know, when 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 Burling looks at his son, he resents the easiness of, of Eric's upbringing and, and Eric's opportunities. But of course, Eric is now catapulted into the middle class and resents his father's accent mm -hmm. and re resents the fact that his father is a, a self-made man and a man of trade. And he's a little bit embarrassed by his father as well. There's that discomfort, isn't there, between the self-made man mm -hmm. and the second generation, but it works in both directions. Yeah. So if we move on to our uh, second question, then that was all question number one. Um, not a surprise with the load of English teachers. So Mr. Burling is, is selfish and consumed by his sense of status. Um, discuss. Well, personally, I agree. I think consumed by a sense of status is probably most evident in the um, the private discussion that he has with Gerald um, when he sort of tries to casually, but it's it's just cringy, isn't it? When he tries to casually drop in that he's going to be awarded a knighthood mm -hmm. and then says, oh, but don't tell anyone. And Gerald says, oh, well, I might mention it to my mother. And he's like, oh, right, OK, then. <laughs> um, and he obviously wants Gerald to mention it because he feels he's got he feels inferior to the Crofts who are, um, he... are born rich not made rich does he also feel that he can maybe um influence the interpreter um when he starts mm. interrogating yeah. by telling him that you know he's been on the um, bench and that um, he was an older man um, and that he's got you know quite a lot of um police officer friends and friends in high places yeah. so you his status to his advantage maybe as well yeah. Even though yeah, he, feels he's un he feels he's untouchable, doesn't he? Yeah, dropping the golf in there. Oh, I play golf, you know. Yeah. Do you think there's an element, like, thinking back to Eric, this idea of um, Eric, Eric becomes something that his father wasn't and therefore feels perhaps he might not fit and therefore Mr. Berlin, mm -hmm. another way of looking at him as being m maybe less selfish, more it's a response to this feeling of him being like an imposter that he has to... Mm -hmm to be able to fit in with Gerald or to be able to move up, you know, to become more socially mobile. It's this kind of imposter syndrome that leads him to act in this way, which often happens mm. isn't it, when people, you know, are, are perhaps born in, in one set of circumstances, they, they become this kind of um, like, and, you know, big, larger than life figure to try and fit into mm. the next rung up the ladder socially. Yeah. It's got a chip on yeah, it's like Mr. Leffley yeah. was saying, he's a blusterer, isn't he? He's a, he's a, he's a bluffer. Have you seen him? 
I think Priestley does it so well in in how he mocks Beerling because Beerling really dominates and he's physically dominant. You know, he's um, it's it describes him in the stage directions as heavy looking, so he's physically dominant, but he also dominates the the early part of the play with these long rambling, quite boring, no offense, Mr. Lefley speeches, and <laughs> um, which are, which are totally wrong. You know, he says the Titanic unsinkable, absolutely unsinkable. Well, a 1945, 1946 audience, and indeed a 2020 audience, are sat there going, it sank. I saw the film. <laughs> Leo and Kate. It didn't end well. Um, so, you know, and actually for us now, Mr. Billings or Mr. Comet character in that sense, but actually a, an audience member sat there in the 1940s will have lost family in World War One when he's saying there's not going to be a war may have struggled through the um the economic depression through the general strike of 1926 may well be sat, sat there in the 1940s having just lost someone in another war um, and actually he doesn't become comic at that point he becomes insulting and i think Priestley uses that dramatic irony really well to make Berling pretty unequivocally a character that we dislike e equally there'll be people that as well that won't have suffered and won't have been exposed perhaps to the mm. you know, think of, think about like the coronavirus crisis now there are some people that have lost their jobs there were people that have lost people mm. you know, people in their families versus others that will be relatively secure will have enjoyed lockdown will have enjoyed that period of time and so there will be those people at the time that won't have experienced those horrors and Berlin's almost like uh, it's like holding up a mirror perhaps to them mm. uh, to, to give them a wider sense of actually what's going it might not directly impact on them but it, it, it has an impact on the way in which our society uh, acts behaves move forward it's very exploitive. But he's going, he's going to go on in the next four years, isn't he, or the next six years, Burling, and make an absolute fortune from the First World War yeah. as an industrialist. His factories are going to produce buckles or mess tins or helmets or uniforms or whatever. And almost certainly Gerald and Eric will volunteer straight away as officers and they'll be dead by the end of 1915. Um, you know, there's, there's a cataclysm coming, isn't there, to this family? Um, Sheila will be a VAD and, you know, she'll get the vote in 1919 or 1920 or whatever it is. You know what I mean? This, this is all coming. Um, and I, I think sometimes we struggle with that in 2020 because it's 100 years ago. But in 1945, no, I think they, they'd all, it, that was living memory and people would have known that. And they would have known there's a quality of that about Eric as well as and there's a kind of doomed quality about Eric. You know, the poor yeah. lad doesn't look yeah. like he, he's not going to last five minutes, is he? Gerald, mm, yeah, maybe. But but Eric's got no chance. He just seems like a boy wearing a man's clothes a lot of the time. Well, he might be the only one to survive because he's quite, he exploits people, doesn't he? He exploits um, women, he exploits people who are uh, yes. low. And... Um, so he might be the only chance, perhaps a bit of a stretch in the 1940s, but having sat through the war and be sat there in the audience, there could be a few Berlins who might be trying mm. to think I'm going to, who have come out of it quite successfully and, you know, have every chance of or every desire to try and reestablish that st like status quo that suits them. But well, he commodifies everything, doesn't he? People are commodities to him. You know, it's all pounds, showing some pence, and um, and you only look after yourself and your own, your own family. You don't look after anybody else. There is no social responsibility. So, of course, in 1945, we returned a Labour government, didn't we? So, I don't think he even looks after his daughter that much, though. He's basically selling her off for a bit of a night. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, offense, Sheila or Gerald, but you know, you're you're a good bargaining chip. It's like you're the dowry. You're like up there with the goats that's being sold off. And <laughs> um, I think uh, we can safely say then, not Beerling fans over here. <laughs> um, okay, so our final question, which I think we have in part already answered in in our discussions already. What is Priestley saying about society at the start of the play? Um, it's certainly not a society. I think that and you know playing Edna. Um, but also being from a working class community myself, um, it's not it's certainly not a society that I would want to have, have lived in. Mm. Um wonder what everybody else thinks about that. 
what it's is about it? division isn't it and inequality i mean the, the the haves and the have nots i mean mm. in effect that runs right down the center of it doesn't it and it's it's quite nice to be the inspector and to be saying these things in a room where he shouldn't be allowed to be and being able to walk in because he's got a badge and he can walk in and he can say these things to people who are his social betters it is that that lovely feeling of being able to throw a brick through a window isn't it not that i ever did that of course but. <laughs> metaphorically i think it's sorry uh, like, well, like class is such an obscure uh, concept or construct mm. actually in that one room it shows quite nicely you know a lot of the time i know that um students sometimes use the term upper class and middle class interchangeably or they don't really yeah. grasp it you get a clear sense you've got edna working class you've then got the um you know probably someone like sybil berlin m might have been mm. uh, you know is it, it, a little bit like the situation perhaps gerald is in like probably from a better family than mr berlin um, yeah. and then you've got mr berlin this social climate and then obviously gerald who is a bit probably naive to the realities of of class and so it shows i think that kind of spectrum of class quite 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 nicely in that one room and how at that time and or probably just a bit before that ability to be able to kind of move up climb up through through the through the different um uh, different levels of class. Mm. yeah i agree and I also think um, we often we always talk about class when we look at the society because it's so it, you know it jumps off the page at you and mm. the fact that Eva Smith is voiceless and actually it has to be um, a man who speaks for her. I think there's a lot we can talk about in terms of gender as well. Um, you know, um, Mrs. Berling is is almost trying to mould Sheila in her image. I feel at the beginning of the play when she talks about you know you know men have important business to do and you just have to accept that that's your role as a wife to accept that and um throughout the play i mean i think it, it became a bit of a running joke when i when i taught this before how many times is sheila told to go to bed by various different um characters um so we we don't just see evidence of those class divides but also that divide in in gender and again particularly for a 2020 audience we see some really archaic um viewpoints here as well and i think that's you know quite interesting to consider in in light of our modern day society as well as look at something that was set over 100 years ago so um i hope you enjoyed act one stay tuned for act two more to come and um, so thank you very much